Good morning, church. My name is Joseph, and it is my joy and privilege to bring you the Word of God today and from the life of Jesus specifically. Please join me in prayer as I ask for God for help in sharing the Word today. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you that we can be listening to your Word today, regardless of where we're gathered and when we're watching this. Please help me speak clearly and let your Word be heard soundly by all who are listening in. Now, more than five years ago, my mother-in-law, Anne, had some serious back pain and fever that she had put down to some, to some bug that will eventually go away. So she took some painkillers and she tried to rest. And after a few days of not getting better, we decided to bring her to the hospital, only for the specialists to diagnose her with sepsis, which is a body's serious overreaction to an infection. Now, if we had delayed the hospital visit any later, it could have been a very serious outcome. And you're most welcome to ask Anne about this episode when you, when you see her, and she'll gladly tell you of God's protection. And also, if you happen to have any back pain and fever, and you speak to her, be ready to be diagnosed with sepsis. Now, in, in today's passage, we see some people come to Jesus for one matter, only to be used as an illustration of a greater problem for all future generations to come. So let's dive right in. Mark is like a, like a Hollywood action movie with non-stop action, as uh, Dom has mentioned in his introductory sermons. And in, his, in the first chapter of Mark, we've seen Jesus do the following. He's taught, he's cast out unclean spirits, and he's healed the sick. Have a look at the immediate verses preceding our passage today. Mark chapter 1 verse 45 says, It shows that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town. And he was out in desolate places. He's become a bit of a cult sensation or a local celebrity thanks to the healed leper in the previous episode. Don preached on this two weeks ago as well. And then we follow in chapter 1 here, in, sorry, in, in, chapter, in chapter 2, verse 1, with a crowd here of this new local celebrity coming back in town. So what do they do? They gather to where Jesus is, and they left no standing room. And what does Jesus do with this huge crowd? What he has come to do. We see that in verse, verses 14 and 15, and verse 38 in chapter 1 where Jesus says that he has come to preach the gospel. And then we, we read about some movement in the crowd outside. In verse 3, we, say, we see that some men came, bringing to him a paralytic, and they couldn't get in among the crowd, so they dug through the roof. Or in the original words, they unroofed the roof, and they lowered the mat down. Now, in case you're wondering, there wasn't any metal uh, tile reefs back then, back in first century Israel. And buildings were built from clay on straw and wood, as you can see from these photos here. So there wasn't any supernatural strength involved here, although some level of effort and determination would still be required to dig through this hardened clay. First century homes tend to have flat roofs with a staircase on the outside to access them. And the roof tends to be re-roofed annually in preparation for the rainy season. So while this wasn't really unusual, it was unexpected, especially when such a crowd was gathering in the house itself. And remember what we said about what Jesus has done so far? He teaches, or well, he's taught, he cast out demons, and he's healed the sick. And Jesus is the great teacher exorcist and the healer. So where do you think uh, these men brought the paralytic in? What do, you, what do these men see as this paralytic's greatest problem? They were desperate to see Jesus the healer. And the large crowd only gave them motivation to get creative. These four men had to fill apart the roof, the clay and straw, on someone else's roof and did some serious balancing to get him close to Jesus. And then what does Jesus do? 
He's healed many people leading up to this point. What do we expect him to do? Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, if I were to paraphrase that to my six-year-old son, I would say, son, the bad consequences from your bad actions have been taken away. And this will make a lot more sense uh, in our household because we are living in close quarters every day. But Jesus is meeting this man for the very first time. And verse 6 onwards tells us of the response that it draws from the teachers of the law in the crowd. But can you imagine what the paralytic and the four men are thinking? And his four friends? Hey Jesus, we didn't do all of this just to have his sins forgiven, mate. Eh? You sure we got the right guy here, fellas? Now we've just come out of the season of sickness in winter and, and, and boy, this winter was quite a tough one on so many of us, especially if we have children in childcare. Every time there's sickness in the family, we're pretty quick to do one thing, which is to go and find medicine. Now I found, found out not too long ago that a whole lot of these over-the-counter medication does not actually help me fight off the bugs. Deal, uh, these medications deal with the symptoms. For example, we have Panadol, Dilfin, Aspirin. These are painkillers. They relieve fevers. They deal with headaches. And we have antihistamines, which stops your runny nose and it deals with other allergy-related symptoms. Now, all the while, I thought that they were helping me fight the bugs for me. But instead of reducing, uh, instead they were only reducing the severity of the symptoms. So that was quite an eye opener for me. And yet, did you know that doctors are not meant to treat symptoms before a diagnosis? Why? Because the symptoms are just clues to the cause of the problem, the sickness. And doctors want to make sure that they can identify and treat the root cause before they start removing the clues. You can just ask our resident GP, Kwa. And here we see that this is exactly what Jesus, the healer, does here in verse 5. He sees this paralyzed man being lowered through the roof by his four buddies, a man who is not walking or not capable of doing anything on his own. And yet what is his biggest problem or sickness to deal with according to Jesus? Sin. A person with a severe, severe disability presented himself, or rather, is presented before Jesus, and Jesus' first concern is to address his sin. The word says, Jesus, do you not care that he doesn't have the dignity to feed himself, the independence to go where he wants, to use the loo privately? Do you not care that he's not been able to explore uh, and travel the world to see what he wants to see. Doesn't he have the right to enjoy life and experience it like everyone else? No. Jesus' main concern isn't about these physical and worldly things. He's more concerned about our spiritual well-being, as Don mentioned two weeks ago. He's more concerned about spiritual matters that have eternal consequences. And why is sin the biggest problem here? Why does Jesus forgive this man's sin? Because we know that from Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that the wages of sin is death, and the end result is death. And this is why sin is our greatest problem. Now, we all know that physical death is one of the two certainties in this world, next to taxes. And Matthew's sermon last week has, um, has touched on the tax side of things, so today we can discuss death a bit. And all of us will eventually die, whether we like it or not. In fact, we are all facing death every day here on this earth. Death at a small scale. Sickness, injury, pain, these are part of the process of our bodies heading towards death sometimes. Emotional pain, quarrels, relationship strains and breakdowns, these are the gradual dial of all our relationships here on this earth. But the death that sin brings is spiritual death, the separation from God, the God who created us and the one who we try to replace with so many things of this world that always end up disappointing us. The result of sin is far worse than 
the result of any suffering you experience in this world. And if we read on later on in chapter 9 of Mark, verses 43 to 48, Jesus says, If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And finally, if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. In Jesus' own words, it is better to be maimed, crippled, or partially blind and not sin rather than physically complete and be separated from God in hell. Jesus knows that man's relationship with God is more important than his comfort, independence, status, and ability. And this is completely counter to what the world tells us, right? Work hard, but make sure that you spend time and money Focusing on yourself. Your body is temple. Make sure you're feeling good. Get the latest EV, eat, the, eat at the latest restaurant, Hokkaido cheesecake shop, maybe. Check out every corner of the earth. Start with the 17 or more countries represented here at GBC. And then come back and work hard again so that you can do it all again. Now, don't get me wrong, uh, there's a time and place for self-care, comfort, and enjoyment of this world that God has created. And they are necessary in keeping our physical death at bay. But be careful when these things end up becoming the highest priority in our lives, taking God's rightful place in our lives. So I'll repeat that in case you missed it the first time. Enjoy what God has given you, but don't let them take over your pro the priority over God. As Tim Keller once said, the human heart is an idol factory that takes good things like a successful career, love, material possessions, and family, even family, and turns them into ultimate things. Now let's have a look now at verses 6 to 8. Look at the people's response to Jesus forgiving sins. Remember the context in which this is happening. Jesus, the local celebrity, steps back into Capernaum. The crowd gathers to hear him teach, and they're hanging on to his every word. They're here to listen and learn. They're here to see miracles happen. And yet there are the scribes or teachers of the law in the midst, by the scholars of the day, the same group Matthew described last Sunday as the people who wrote volumes of religious laws. They have seen this incredible display of faith by the four friends. And what are they focused on? Jesus claimed to forgive sins. They can't get over it. Jesus' statement might have seemed odd to us as we read it today, but it was a huge deal for the teachers of the law. They know from the Old Testament that only God can forgive sins, not just anyone. And here is Jesus claiming to do the one thing they know only God alone can do. That's blasphemy. They are shocked and taken aback by what Jesus has said here. They do not connect the dots between Jesus and God. Now, interestingly, their claim that Jesus is blaspheming actually becomes the primary accusation against Jesus at the end of his ministry, as we'll eventually see. Now, come with me to verse 8 now. And we see Jesus respond showing that he picks up on their thoughts. Why are you thinking these things? Why are you upset about me forgiving sins? And Jesus knows their thoughts, the doubting of his words. He as God knows our hearts and what we're thinking, even our motives for the things that we do. And Jesus proceeds to ask a rhetorical question in the next two verses, which is easier to forgive sin, or to heal a paralyzed man. Now, if you've ever known someone who's been paralyzed or bedridden for a long time, one of the things that you can be sure to expect is a long recovery involving many physio visits, therapies, and all sorts of different treatments, mostly due to muscle atrophy. Muscles, basically muscles that don't get used, they waste away. Just ask all the gym junkies that we have, like Jamie and Lewis, or the athletes in our midst. 
And here, to have a paralytic, one who hasn't even moved their body, to a hot, one who hasn't even stood up uh, in a long time, to get him to stand up, walk, and grab his mat, in other words, to make a full recovery, that's a miracle. And everyone knows, everyone there knows that this full recovery is impossible. But the scribes or the teachers of the law, they know that forgiving sins is impossible by men. But which of these two, which of these two here, can be witnessed by the crowd? The healing of the paralytic. And while, while the passage seems to say it in passing, we can quite easily miss it. But I hope you don't miss it today. Have a look at verse 10. What does Jesus say? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to... To do what? To heal? To draw a good crowd? To bring the roof down? No! It's to forgive sins. Remember who he is addressing here? Is it just his followers? The paralyzed man and his friends? No! It includes the teachers of the law who are questioning him. It includes his enemies. Remember what Jesus said about what he has come to earth to do? To preach the gospel. To teach about the kingdom of God. And it is not just for his keen followers and allies. He comes to teach even his enemies. Let me say that again. Jesus came to preach the good news of salvation to his enemies. Maybe you're not a believer of Jesus. Maybe you're a skeptic of the faith of Jesus. I pray that the passage today will reveal to you the primary concern of Jesus and how we all need to be saved from our sin. If a paralytic needs saving from his sins, what more all of us who are of sound body and mind, who are able to commit even worse sins. As we've seen in Mark 2 today, I hope that our response is similar to that described in verse 12. Right after Jesus tells the man to rise up, pick up his bed, and go home, he does just that. And notice what the collective response was. They were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, God demonstrates his own love for us, in that, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Whether you identify with the crowd listening to Jesus, the teachers of the law questioning him, or you're like the paralyzed man just submitting to others in life, we all start from the same position of being enemies of God due to sin. And yet, as we've seen from Jesus' response to the crowd, Jesus Christ died for you, his enemy, to save you from your sins so that you can be in relationship with God. Not because you're lovely, and stood out from others, but because he first loved us. So if you do not have a relationship with Jesus yet, that is the point of today's passage for you. There are many challenges and troubles in life. Loneliness, painful relationships, work stress or unemployment, health problems or money problems. We all have our fair share. Yet when you bring all these before God, his diagnosis is that your biggest problem, your primary problem, is that of sin. This is the disease that he wants to deal with first. Because the prognosis, the eventual outcome, is eternal death. Now one of the biggest obstacles to faith is the belittling of sin's effects. It's hard enough having to accept that we are physically heading towards death. But to know that we are on a march towards spiritual death as well, we tend to think of sin, or well, we tend to think that we aren't too bad spiritually because we think of sin as a spectrum, a range. Maybe we have lying, speeding, cursing down the one end, stealing, gossiping near the middle, and murder and rape down the extreme end. And yet every one of those separate us from God because of his holiness. 
Are you aware of your sin and that you need to be healed from that? Praise God that he has healed us from the effects of sin through what Jesus has done on the cross, as we read in Isaiah and Romans. You see, it wasn't the paralytic man who was the only one who needed forgiveness for his sins. Everyone there was a sinner. However, most people thought that they were doing all right as they didn't have obvious symptoms of death on their lives. The paralytic was the only one who knew he needed help, even though it was for something physical. Now, as Matthew preached last week, we hear Jesus say in Mark chapter 2, verse 17, that he has come to call the sinners, not the righteous. Have you gone to see this spiritual doctor, the one who is available 24-7 at any place and time, to heal you of your sickness of sin? Or are you continuing to think that you are strong and healthy? And if you would like to come to Jesus today for the forgiveness of sins, maybe speak to a Christian next to you. Don't delay. Anything that you think is worth more, even your pride and ego, will be like rubbish in light of that. Here's the other application for believers. And I say this after challenging myself multiple times over as I'm working on this passage. How are we bringing others closer to Jesus? Are we like the crowd that's happy to gather and sit in large numbers to listen to Jesus' words and stop there? Or are we like the four friends of the paralytic whose faith enabled them to think creatively in order to bring their friend close to Jesus? There is quite a lot for what they believed in, which I'll summarize in four C's here. Number one, cash, because they gave up the they, they gave up working to earn more since they get taxed so heavily, as Matthew pointed out last Sunday. And for us today, this would be like um, us giving up working overtime and Sunday a Bible pay. The second one is comfort, as they gave up resting at home or going somewhere else for entertainment. For us today, this would be like giving up our usual hangout session with our friends, or our, preci- our precious sleeping time. The third one, criminal record, and destroying someone else's roof uninvited, with a whole crowd witnessing. Hopefully the new good layers like we have here at GBC. And the fourth C, convenience. As they gave up listening to this local celebrity called Jesus, as part of the crowd. But if you're a parent, you know how tiring it is to carry your child as they grow older and they're able to run around on their own and still they demand to be carried. Instead, these four friends took on the heavy, literally heavy task of carrying this paralytic friend upstairs and onto a roof, a task that required four able-bodied men to do it. And then they had the hard task of peeling away, taking apart a roof, and potentially needing to fix it again, whether physically or paying for the damage done. They chose the most inconvenient option of all. I mean, who would think it's an easy task to carry your paralytic friend to a large gathering and get them to the star of the show? Does our faith enable us to risk our four seas to bring people to Christ? Now, we have many ministries in church that are, that are not very convenient. Taking time out to teach the kids or the youth, not very convenient, especially not when we spent most of the week dealing with kids at home or at work. Yes, I also do mean that we do have childish colleagues that we have to deal with. And yet our GBK and GBY ministries are such crucial ministries where we are literally sharing the gospel with our younger members, bringing them closer to Christ. Our key men set up, pack up, sound ministries. They're not very convenient. Having to arrive early and leave late every Sunday, be running around ensuring church is not distracting for others, keeping the venue in good shape so that we can keep using it. Sacrificing the convenience of relaxing and chatting with others. These are all unseen ministries, yet They are the reason we can gather and sing God's praise and hear His words, drawing us closer to God. 
Leading and or hosting fellowship groups or other events, not very convenient as well. Having to clean up one's place before and after. Preparing to read, lead Bible studies midweek, not very convenient too. Yet necessary to bring our family closer to Christ. Whether in prayer, fellowship, songs, or the study of God's word. It is really convenient to put aside time to listen, listen to or to help out church members who are hurting or in need of help. Yet the challenges of life can crowd out the voice of Jesus quite easily. Now we moved homes, uh, we moved homes last week to Franklin, uh, where this is being recorded right now, and a bunch of people from GVC gave up convenience and comfort to come and help us move. And they definitely helped take a huge load off our shoulders so that we could move on with life. Maybe you could prepare meals or babysit for someone for others in emergencies, catch up over a couple when some of them need company. Are you willing to risk your convenience for the sake of others coming closer to Christ? What about your reputation and relationship with non-believers? Are you willing to risk that? Can you find ways to be the gospel at work through your actions and words? To be pushing back on the effects of sin and death on our colleagues and the workplace? Pray and ask God for boldness to live it up. Imagine a church of believers where everyone risks their four C's to bring others closer to Jesus. Surely that would leave others amazed and glorifying God. If you're not already involved in any ministry, prayerfully consider how you can be helping bring your church members closer to Christ. Perhaps in one of those that I've mentioned, discuss with the groups with whom you're meeting about how you can help. There are a few questions here uh, for your discussion after this sermon. It's also in your outline. If, there's, if that's not something that you can add to your plate now, which is fine, then don't forget to encourage your fellow brother or your sister in Christ who are serving in any of these ministries. Thank them for helping others. Thank them for helping bring others closer to Christ. And in case you need some role models, there are a few GBCers that come to mind. Catherine who could have chosen to chosen to work to earn more or spend more time on self-care, yet she chooses to give up cash, comfort, and convenience to reach out to the crew and ladies, invite them to church, connect with them, and to lead Bible studies with them past midnight. We have Chris who gave up cash and convenience and chooses not to work on Sunday mornings, but he comes to church early to help open up clean up after church, and when go to work later on. We have Caroline, who could be resting at home in the lead up to her second baby's arrival, yet she gave up comfort and convenience and decides to kick off the Spanish Bible study last month. Daniel and Rachel, who juggle family responsibilities with three children and many medical appointments, yet they choose to give up comfort and convenience to host and lead fellowship groups in addition to serving on Sundays at GBKs. Some of you have the privilege to be meeting at their house today as well. They know that the result of sin is far worse than any suffering on this earth, which is why they are willing to give up some of these forces. Encourage them and ask them about how they do it. Now for many of you in our church who are already serving in various capacities, Please be encouraged today that even when others don't see your service, God sees it all and he knows your hearts and thoughts. He sees how you are bringing people to Christ so that he can deal with their greatest problem of sin and death. God's praise is infinitely better than that of men. Let's pray. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you know our sicknesses and sufferings yet you chose to deal with our biggest problem, sin. We thank you for Jesus' death on the cross that has healed and forgiven us. Bring us back to you. Please grant us faith to trust and obey you and give us the strength to risk our first seas to bring others closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.